Hey there, Luke here. Something I always see in the forums is that you can't print flexibles on a Bowden system like we have here on the Ender 3. Well, today, with the help of a new extruder, I'm here to tell you that you can. You can print something like this, like our Ninja Flex here, at the same speed as direct drives. All right, here's the Benchy printed in Ninja Flex, as you can see. Comes right back, no big deal. Little bit of stringing. A um, couple other random little defects there, still working out some of the kinks, but this is a lot better than, you know, some of my other tries, but what are you going to do? So I'll go through down below. We'll get started on the tutorial, how to put it together and then how to assemble it and calibrate it for your machine. I have timestamps down below, or you can just watch the whole thing. So. I'll have a list of all the settings that I've used below for this particular Ender 3. That should be fairly compatible with the CR10 with the stock hot end. Otherwise, this is unmodified. I haven't flashed the firmware and I haven't changed the hot end out. So everything else is just a stock C uh, Ender 3. So yeah, it's, I'm, I'm pretty excited to share this. So let's get right into it and let, let's build it. Alright, so what we have here is all the components you need to build your very own new shooter. So uh, starting in the center is the main block here. So um, the, the important part here is that um, as long as you print it out and you don't use supports on the inside of here, um, it's all designed to be printed without supports. So I didn't use any and it is printed in the vertical direction. So on your screen it is printed vertical up, you should be able to see the layer lines here. Um, <clears throat> The other two printed parts are the upper block, uh, which goes and assembles to the top here, as well as this small axle, which will go into the next category of parts. So uh, next on the list is uh, we have our, I guess, specialty parts. Um, so one, we have a 608ZZ bearing, uh, super common. So it's not really specialty. These are like 25 cents a pop, 30 cents a pop, something like that, really cheap. Um, next is an M10 uh, to four millimeter uh, pneumatic connector. So this will go in the end and where your Bowden tube will go into or you know whatever, whatever you like. And then um, the third one here is a E3D Hobgoblin. So it's capable of being used with any um, eight millimeter OD, five millimeter ID, um, uh, Mark eight type gear. I just prefer E3Ds because of their excellent machining centers. Um, so now that we've got that out of the way, we have our remaining standard hardware. So for the Ender 3 um, and CR10 and any variants like that, um, we're going to need four 35mm um, M3 screws. And then for every new extruder, we'll need four 40mm uh, M3 screws. And then four M3 nuts. So. Here we have just the regular nuts. Nothing, nothing too special about that as I drop it. So um, for assembly, uh, what we're gonna wanna do here is just assemble the um, 608ZZ to the bearing and then press the axle into the groove that is on the inside here. So as you can see, there's a small groove placed in here. All we have to do is just kind of press it in, easy peasy, no problem. So um, the bearing should be able to move freely and the axle should be pressed in all the way. If you have gunk on the inside from when you printed it, um, just work it out, it should be fine. So there we can see the, the bearing can move back and forth and spin fairly freely, um, but yet it's fairly tight within there. So this is what presses the filament against the, um, the small channel on the inside here um, that the filament path goes through. So that's pretty much one of the reasons why I, I really, I really like this, um, this design and, and uh, that's why I made it like it. So um, the next thing that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna start assembling the, um, the upper block to the lower block through the holes here. So um, all we're gonna have to do is place the M3 nuts into the uh, holes that are sized perfectly for them. And then on the opposite side, place the upper block with 608ZZ bearing. Um, so the area that we just pressed the channel in, we're gonna want to uh, match that to where the groove is and to make sure that the 
um, the part where we stuck it in is facing down. So that way as you tighten it, the um, bearing cannot be lost from its hole. From there, I, I prefer to run at least two through. Um, so it works fine with two, but four you know, makes it so that there's more even pressure um, all the way around. But I've, I've used it with two and, and sometimes even one in, in a pinch if I'm just testing something out. So the friction in between these two blocks should hold these screws in place as we go through and tighten them. So as you can see, they're sitting there without holding them in, but they're actually pretty easy just to press in. So we can take our nuts and put them in a hole again, and then tighten them down. So here, and we'll just uh, um, try to get the um, nuts started here on the screws. So it'll be kind of a delicate game. Let's let it rattle around. But as you can see, the nuts are getting sucked in um, and it is tightening down. So we'll do the same thing as we go around here. If you're having a hard time uh, starting a nut, simply use another object. Uh, I have this pin here, but you can use another screw or you know whatever you like. Um, and just uh, make sure that the nut is pressed down all the way and you should be able to start the nut uh, much easier on the screw um, once you're guaranteed that it's square against the bottom of the channel on the bottom here. So uh, once you're done with that, um, the last thing to do for assembly of the actual block itself is to just um, start this um, M10 uh, threading here. So um, mine works pretty well. My, my hole sizes are pretty good, so that's in there pretty solid. I can't really uh, turn it anymore, um, and it, it seemed to thread appropriately, so I can't really pull it out here either. Um, but uh, your hole size may differ, so it might require a bit more force to, to put it in there, so you might need to get like a ratchet or a wrench or something like that, or you might need to glue it in if your holes are too large. Um, so it works, works well for um, how I have my holes tuned. Um, so the next uh, couple things that we're gonna have to install, which is pretty machine uh, dependent here, um, but if it's the Ender 3 or the CR10 should be much of the same, is to swap the gear on the current um, motor to the Hobgoblin here. The way that the um, CR10 slash Ender 3 version differs specifically is the countersink on the holes here, um, which allows the uh, extra room which allows the uh, extra length here um, to account for the plate that sits in between the block and the motor. So uh, that's really the only difference. Otherwise, um, the normal one sits at about here. And it so it has uh, some thread engagement, uh, about the appropriate amount for a NEMA 17, but it doesn't sink too far in uh, compared to that, which is too much if you're mounting it directly to a motor. So. Uh, once uh, for my friend's uh, machine here, we'll, we'll get that mounted up and, and away we go. All right, so we move forward in time here. We have our uh, mostly assembled block and we have our Mark 8 um, gear, which uh, this one is specifically a Hobgoblin from E3D. Finally, we have our new piece of tubing. So you don't need to do this. Um, I figured since I'm already improving the how well the uh, the Bowden system constrains the filament. We might as well go and upgrade to the Capricorn. So this is a highly recommended upgrade as well. And uh, we're gonna take off the old extruder and then uh, install this one. So I've already taken the fitting off here and here. All I did was I used uh, my hands to take off this one and then I used the wrench that's provided with the uh, Ender 3 to take off this fitting. And then I took out the Bowden tube from it. We will be reusing this fitting but we will not be reusing the fitting that came on this end because there is already one installed as it goes crazy. There's already one installed on the uh, block itself. So we have no need for the other one. This right here is the reason why you need an idler. Look at that. Now when you're assembling it, all you need to do is uh, have the screws in ahead of time and 
then as you see it'll stick out the back side so all you need to do is place the screws in the holes and then let them sink down all right hi there it's Luke from the future so everything that you're about to see do it on the opposite side so currently the gray block here is facing forward to the front of the machine this is the appropriate orientation the installation video was done facing the back of the machine and you'll need to face it this way in order to get the correct extrusion direction for how this gear spins. If you install it this way, you'll have to flip it around by flashing new firmware with the extruder uh, direction reversed or do some flipping in your wires. But both of those aren't something that I really want you to do. So again, make sure that the direction is with the bearing facing forwards. So here it fits in the exact same volume as before and make sure however you have your fitting it goes out. You can also have a fitting here and then that will appropriately constrain the filament before it goes in but I, I don't think I'll need it for now since I have this roller that should uh, help out quite a bit. So you're going to want to take your extruder motor and uh, put on the extruder gear making sure to put the uh, screw the set screw on the flat portion of it we just have to make an initial guess on where it will be but we'll have to line this up with where the groove is on the inside there for the filament so as you can see we are clearly clearly too low and we'll need to raise that up probably almost near the top Much closer, but just a touch more. Beautiful. What we need to do now is just tighten down these screws on the top here. As you can see, even without a constraining 608 bearing on the other end, the filament path goes straight through and it pretty much only leaves confines to touch the gear and then go back in. The other portion is that by using uh, a similar fitting as on the uh, hot end, the Bowden tube will actually go to a special pocket on the inside to make sure that there's no room for that filament to move after it goes past the gear. That's something that I actually had a problem with on the stock one. Since the tube actually goes to about here, but the fitting you know, it goes to here. So there's actually a hard point when it goes into the fitting and a hard point when it goes into the tube. So I actually ran into a whole bunch of problems trying to get the filament to feed in here in the first place, where I'd have to take off this fitting and then uh, run the filament from the, this end into here, into the tube, and then screw it back on. So this does not have any of those flaws. It goes straight through. Now we need to put our top carriage with the tensioning bearing onto the extruder and tighten it down so it permanently clamps the filament against the gear. When you tighten it down, make it so it's only, you know, lightly finger tight. Don't clamp it down all the way. What we need to do in order to make sure that it's clamped down with the appropriate amount of tension is we'll actually start by running the extruder and then tightening it until filament comes out and then give it another complete two turns. That typically sends the correct tension for most standard filaments like PLA, ABS, or PETG. For flexibles, you might need to go tighter or looser depending on the, on the filament. Next comes the Capricorn tubing. Simply insert it on one end. So I'm going to leave the filament in and just thread it along. Insert it in until it stops. As I said before, the end point is actually inside of the block, meaning that there is a smooth transition between where it leaves the gear and where it enters the tube. There shouldn't be any catch points inside of this fitting there since it's a pass-through fitting. So now in order to install it on the other end, simply put your fitting on. And then put the tubing in all the way, making sure that it makes excellent contact with the nozzle below. If you have a gap, there will be leaks and you will get lots of jams. So now that I'm fairly confident it's tight, I lower the fitting down and I screw it in. This makes sure that when I install it, it places um, compression against the uh, nozzle, making sure that there aren't any more gaps. 
you may need to use your wrench. Then re-add the little plastic clip. All right, perfect. The system is installed. Now we just need to make sure that it works. Calibrate it um, because the uh, Mark 8 gear has a different diameter, which means that it will take more steps per, to get one millimeter. So remember before we said to keep, make sure to keep this loose. Now we're gonna work on getting it to extrude filament so we can begin calibration. So what we'll do to make sure it's the correct tightness is that we'll start by extruding some filament. So hopefully you can hear the motor start turning, but there isn't filament coming out. So simply tighten the screws in a cross pattern until the bearing is compressed against the gear and filament starts coming out. You hopefully should be able to see that this is moving ever so slowly, which means that we have a near appropriate tightness. So you don't want to over compress it, but you definitely don't want to under compress it either. My recommendation is that you um, tighten this down until the gear starts moving and then you get all four screws to the same tightness and tighten it another turn or two for each one. That gives you even pressure all the way around, a firm grip, but doesn't over compress it. Now we can start calibration. I'm just going to take a small length of the old tubing, stick it in the end there, and extrude out some filament just like we did before. I have a link in the description below that will show what I used when I initially set this Ender 3 up to calibrate, which should contain all the instructions. I intend to fully do that here, just with this small section, which will calibrate it to the size of the new gear. So we're at 13.16 millimeters. I extruded 20, so we'll have to uh, increase the amount of steps per millimeter by the ratio of 20 by 13, and uh, try again. So you can just do that in the configuration menu of your Ender 3 or by reflashing with, with Marlin if you have a bootloader installed and you like to do it that way. Personally, I like to have my calculated answers in the root firmware instead of just storing them in EEPROM, but uh, some users may not be comfortable with uh, flashing new firmware. So you can do it either way. All right, if we do our quick maths, we're at about 141 steps per millimeter, give or take. Because we take the 94, we multiply it by 20, and then we divide it by 13.7, which increases the amount of steps that we need to get per millimeter, which makes sense because we were short. So now we sit here and we spin the wheel until we're bored or until we get to the number that we want. This is also the other reason why I, uh, I prefer just flashing it. You can also set this with uh, G-code commands, actually, which is probably the smarter option. I don't have this hooked up to my computer, but you might. All right, so I used the M92 to set my E-steps to my newly calculated um, number of steps per millimeter, and then I'll just hit the uh, save config button or uh, use the G-code for that as well. You can use this doing, you're using the monitor in Kira or Pronterface or whatever the heck you like, but it's a lot easier than spinning that knob for forever. Now we do it again. Make sure you use the same technique to cut it off. That way you guarantee that you won't have um, strange errors. Much closer. All right, so now it's all calibrated. Uh, I got 144.5, gets me 20 millimeters when I hit the 20 millimeter extrude button. And so now we're ready to hook it up back into the system. If you set your tension correctly, you should be able to pull it out and put it in while the motors are disabled and just slide it in. But otherwise, just use the power feed button you know, just extrude it normally, and it should begin filling. So just to make sure that everything was good, I started a fill from when the filament was out there, and I wanted to make sure that it would feed in here without any sort of hiccups. So you should be able to just put filament at the mouth, touching the gear on the inside, hit go, wait for it to snag, and you should be good to go. And there you go. Now it is starting to extrude at the end, properly calibrated. Now let's get a print going. All right, and here we have our finished print. What I did was I reduced the uh, retraction that I was using, which was uh, five millimeters, down to three millimeters, and it looks like everything came out perfectly. Super pleased, no signs of under extrusion, just right. A little bit of stringing on the inside there, so we'll work on that a little bit more, but otherwise, this is a pretty darn good print. Now let's load in the fun stuff. I'm gonna go with NinjaFlex. 
All right, it is time for the ultimate challenge, Ninja Flex. Let's see if we can get it to go through there. So, in order to start the Ninja Flex, all you need to do is take out your previous filament, heat up the nozzle, and then insert the Ninja Flex right at the beginning here. Allow the tooth to grab it and push it forward. You may need to adjust the tension on the upper block, either loosen or tighten it before putting it in, and then give it a couple extra turns to make sure it's secured. Uh, be careful of over tightening though, or you'll smash the filament into the gear and nothing will move appropriately. Okay, so we will be printing a simple calibration piece at 60 millimeters a second, 235 nozzle and 60 bed with five millimeter retraction. So this should not work. Um, the recommended speeds are well below 60, but you know what? Might as well give it a shot. All right, well, we have extruded everything out. Let's take a look at what we have here. So it looks like we were in fact going a little too fast. I mean, that's kind of, that's to be expected. But the outlines, so the perimeters that were at 50% under speed, they came out well. So it looks like we're at 30 um, millimeters per second and we'll get a perfect top layer. I didn't expect this to work, but this just shows that it can be done quickly and you know, it comes out all right. All right, now we're gonna do the exact same thing, but at half the speed, should be perfect. All right, there we have one, you know, printed thing out of NinjaFlex here. So let's take it off and just, you know, take a look at the general quality of it. So there is some stringing, so that's something that we can work on with our retraction settings. But otherwise, you know, I I think that's pretty dang good. That's pretty benchy. There you have it. Proof that you can print out flexibles on something as simple as the Sender 3. All you need to do is to print out a new shooter, get the hardware and assemble it and you're good to go. You can print just the same as a direct drive or another high-end printer. I think that's a great achievement for something like the Ender 3, especially for the price point that it comes in at. I mean, these are budget machines, but they're able to get something that can crush as easily as that. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the new shooter, or feel free to comment on the Thingiverse. I'll try to respond and, and help you out there. If you liked the video, hit like, hit subscribe, and I'll keep putting out improvement guides like this one here for the Thunder 3. We're not even halfway done with the improvements that I want to put on this machine. Keep printing. Hasta la bye bye.